dogs and my email was marked as spam. Oops, we've got it all. Uh, it's getting there. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we'll do check, check. <laughs> Um, good morning, I apologize right, for second. Yeah. <laughs> good morning. It's Friday routing working group session and we begin with Yes, I apologize for delay. Um so uh this is an update on the work uh what we were uh discussing in uh VFD working group and um um uh, in course of the uh presentation I'll try to explain uh why um I think that it might be interesting for the RTGVG group, not only for BFD group. So uh, we are all uh, f well familiar with the uh, BFD uh, and uh, the specification. Uh, it's a very successful uh, uh, development uh, design of the protocol that being uh, deployed in uh, many networks over uh, different uh, transports, uh, IP and PLS to the wire. Uh, so we are, um, people are working on uh, uh, applying it to overlay networks, but um, now and then, uh, especially in the BFD group, since we're uh, uh, the core uh, for their uh, BFD protocol, uh, there are uh, proposals and discussions about um, some um, extensions to BFD, for example, uh, to monitor the quality of BFD session because uh, BFD as a uh, fault uh, failure detection protocol has some leverage of how many messages in a row it has, uh, has to be missed in order to detect failure. But uh, what is, might be of interest is that to know, for example, if detect multiplier is uh, three, so how many really messages did we miss? We are receiving constantly each and every message, or we start missing one or two messages, but then third message arrives, and well, okay, we keep the session up. 
Um, again, uh, there are some proposals just to uh, um, evaluate the performance and uh, path MTU uh, because uh, BFD designed to be lightweight and efficient, uh, it is only a very small uh, control message, but um, there is interest to see if we can um, do something more with it. So here's, uh, uh, we came up with there some ideas of how we can make uh, BFD extended, uh, extensible, and um, another, uh, uh, motivation was that we have very interesting discussion on uh, authentication in BFD. Uh, authentication in BFD is a sort of a, you configure it and you must do it on each and every packet. So uh, if you can imagine if uh, BFD um, interval is 3.3 .3 milliseconds or, or, or at that uh, rate, so that doing authentication in each and every packet in both directions uh, that's kind of um, heavy load on the system. Um, there is a proposal that a working group uh, completed, uh, discussing and uh, progressing further, that to do um, intermittent um, authentication for BFD session. But uh, there are some other issues that really doesn't make it always at will. So there are some constraints to that, especially in asynchronous mode. So um, let's move on and get to the technical details. So the proposal is that uh, because BFD control message does not specify how it's encapsulated in a transport, it only defines the control message. And uh, the size, as I mentioned, it's a fixed whether it's unauthenticated mode or authenticated mode. Uh, for authenticated mode, it's predictable. So our proposal is this, uh, to have a BFD control message uh, for, pro, again, idea of a guard ward just for safety, to separate it, and then followed by TOV, and TOV can have enclosed uh, sub-TOVs, so uh, that makes it extensible. Well, at the same time, of course, uh, might be uh, not as uh, hardware friendly. Um, so to understand whether it's a regular BFD control message or um, uh, extended, uh, of course, um, because BFD, at least in IP network, works over UDP, um, we need to uh, look at the uh, UDP length, uh, length field in a UDP header. Um, BFD itself has a, a negotiation process, a uh, three-way handshake, uh, exchanging the, um, the um, discriminators. Um, yes, um, that uh, handshake can be um, substituted uh, by uh, some communication uh, in the control plane, and one of the examples is BFD over MPLS LSP, when LSP ping is used to bootstrap uh, BFD session. Another example could be as what we uh, what is proposed for MVPN to use uh, um, extension in B, uh, BGP. Uh, there is another example in uh, PMSM for um, DR BDR fast uh, failover. Uh, to uh, advertise BGP discriminator uh, in uh, PIM hello option. Um, what we uh, complement uh, this negotiation is with a capability negotiation between uh, BGP peers. And uh, so they can negotiate uh, loss measurement, delay measurement, uh, uh, path uh, MTU discovery monitoring, and uh, lightweight uh, authentication. And uh, as you notice, uh, each field uh, ha uh, occupies uh, two bit uh, positions because um, each of these modes uh, envision be able to support it as uh, part of periodic messages or um, echo request reply, which is uh, supported by uh, poll final sequence in BFD. 
Um, and uh, as in every capability negotiation, so the active uh, side announces its uh, interest, uh, the other side uh, sends uh, uh, what it agrees to and supports, and then uh, out of that uh, they can um, con uh, d uh, conclude uh, what will be used. Uh, performance measurement, the proposal is to reuse uh, encodings um, defined in RFC 6374, um, was and delay measurement over MPLS networks. And uh, the nice uh, part about it is that um, these um, uh, messages are allowed to do um, separate loss delay measurement, um, direct uh, measurements by collecting counters, and combine loss delay measurement. And uh, because of uh, BFD, uh, these measurements can be either um, um, unidirectional or bidirectional. Unidirectional as part of um, peri uh, periodic uh, messages or bidirectional using echo uh, request reply or poll final sequence. And uh, 6374 supports uh, one-way performance measurement and uh, direct loss measurement. So um, this slide's just an illustration of uh, how um, encodings from RFC 6374 can be uh, used in uh, this uh, integrated OEM or extended BFD. Um, so we're just using TLV to encode uh, their message that already defined in RFC 6374. Uh, for loss measurement, for delay measurement, and for combined measurement. And again, um, it doesn't have to be sent uh, on high frequency of, for example, uh, BFD messages that uh, monitor uh, path continuity, but they can be sent as part of the uh, poll final sequence. So then, um, the load on a system and um, it would be not that uh, challenging. Or uh, Path MTU monitoring, uh, it introduces basically a uh, padding type of uh, TLV, which uh, can have um, arbitrary length sent to it, and uh, it can be used um, as for um, in the proposal BFD uh, large packets um, set to certain value and again used in the poll final sequence uh, to uh, casually and uh, uh, time to time monitor the path. Um, and um, one of the uh, benefits of using a uh, poll final sequence is that uh, it does not interfere uh, with their more uh, frequent exchange or transmission of periodic messages by each side. And uh, then uh, local policy can set um, its own rules on when to constitute that um, link is down because um, it could be reaction to um, not receiving final message uh, once or just uh, two consecutive or three consecutive, so it could be uh, really independent uh, local policy um, rule. Um, authentication capability. Uh, as I mentioned, the current uh, definition of authentication in BFD uh, applies to each and every packet, and uh, that is a quite severe burden on a system. Uh, that um, very aggressively monitors uh, path between two systems. Um, and the proposal here is that um, to give the cap uh, capability of authenticating uh, whether um, periodic messages, uh, or final messages, or combination of both. Uh, and um, Again, uh, using for poll final messages like in MTU, it gives a local uh, policy opportunity to define the rules uh, when they declare that uh, session is uh, invalid. 
Um, so this diagram uh, is just a caption of um, how the lightweight uh, authentication uh, will work uh, in the poll final sequence. And um, it basically defines, uh, for now, um, one of the protocols only uh, to use it as a, a hashing function. So the next steps, uh, what we're, uh, we'll continue, we'll continue the discussion in uh, BFD uh, working group. And uh, we welcome uh, your comments, questions, and uh, suggestions. Uh, whether uh, you see any uh, interest or use of this integrated uh, OEM protocol. Hi, uh, Andrew Gray with Charter Communications. Uh, interesting draft, actually like it. Uh, one quick question I had while I was scrolling through it, and uh, I've only had one cup of coffee, so that might be impacting things as well. How does micro BFD play into this if we're doing this across lags? Uh, micro oh, SBFD, because I, I, I'm I, I, sorry, I, I'm not familiar with the micro BFD. I know there is a SBFD uh, technology, micro BFD. Ah, BFD over. Good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I forgot about it. Yes, you, you have a better memory. And um, okay, um, so again. Um, so BFD over lag spans uh, single hop sessions over each constituent link. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I think that might be applicability, again, because uh, this draft allows you, uh, this mechanism allows you to use only these extensions over poll final sequence. Okay, and, and I think that poll final sequence will go only one, not on each individual uh, lag right. constituent, but okay, I will have to admit now I'm speculating, I haven't thought about it I will. I, I would say from our perspective uh, there would be a fair amount of interest in having that either in the negotiation or the capability negotiation or something like that adding that in because a lot of our sessions are over many many yes, yeah. as, as, as I remember um, this RFC uh, basically, uh, what it does, it just automates uh, creation of uh, single hop BFD sessions over constituents. Session itself has no distinction from single hop BFD session. E pretty much, yes, but my understanding of it is it's a capability that needs to be distinctly enabled on both sides. So yes. since we're already negotiating basically all the other parameters at the same time, it might be something um, interesting. My, my understanding that uh, each individual session comes up individually, uh, independently of all other sessions and all other constituents. Uh, Greg, sorry, it has to interact with min link configured. It's more complex than what you're thinking. Okay, yeah. okay, but again, as I said, thank you for the question. I haven't thought about it. Uh, we'll work on it. All right, I'll email you as well about it too. Thank you. And uh, from my perspective, the micro BFD is very widely deployed technology, very useful, and should definitely be considered when you work on the next version, next generation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Tony Lee, Arista. Um, as you probably know, we've been trying to get BFD into hardware for a long time now. Um, and of course, this makes it harder. Uh, is there any way we could do this not in BFD? Um. Well, one of the proposals is to have a protocol which inherits some of BFD uh, nice features uh, like um, timer negotiation and some robustness. And basically we have a new protocol, uh, non-BFD, which, which uses a different uh, well-known destination port. Uh, follow up the question, uh, Louis Chen from Juniper. So will, will you consider, because I know that it's like a piggyback all the TLV in the one packet, right? If I'm not wrong. Uh, not all of them. I, yeah. I, I, I would probably say that uh, I don't see the reason to piggyback, uh, maybe. Okay. I mean, multiple if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you do 
Uh, some extension plus authentication, yes, you might have two TLVs and authentication will be the last one. But I would don't, not see uh, the real uh, need for more than one TLV. Okay, the reason why I ask that because is if you separate the different TLV into different packets, then easier to implement hardware for, I mean, the kind of response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and again, um, to your question, attorney question, um, uh, I, I want to stress that there is no requirement to do it in the periodic messages. All these extensions can work in a poll final sequence. And the poll final sequence usually is processed, well, at least as a bump in the wire. So if not in control plane, then bump in the wire. So. Okay, well, thank you for your comments and uh, especially I appreciate the uh, suggestion to look into micro BFD use case. Thank you. Uh, next up is Shinsuke Homa. Uh, uh. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Shinsuke, and I'm a researcher of entity laboratories. Um, this draft uh, was uh, originally proposed in Comspoff, and it's first time to uh, present this draft in this working group. So I will talk about uh, the digest of content uh, of this draft and introduce uh, our related work in this presentation. It might be helpful just to be a little closer to the microphone. Okay, okay, so. A little louder. Okay, so firstly, uh, I, don't, uh, I will uh, talk about uh, the background of this uh, document. So as you know, uh, devices and services are diversing, and the uh, network uh, will be uh, required to uh, apply to such diversity. And uh, net network slicing uh, is an emerging approach to apply uh, networks to such diversity. So. Uh, and uh, several SDOs are uh, discussing uh, about it, uh, including 3GBP. So, and ITF had started uh, to discuss uh, transport slice. So, in network slicing, end-to-end uh, -end network slice, uh, uh, realization of end-to-end -end network slice uh, is very important uh, for uh, provide assured uh, communication quality for each service. And 3GPP has a Slice subnet concept. Uh, Slice subnet is a group of network functions and connectivity, and an end-to-end -end Slice uh, will be uh, composed of uh, one or more uh, subnets. Uh, please note uh, that uh, this uh, definition uh, and terminology are different from uh, one of uh, Network Slice design team in TIS. Uh, they don't use uh, subnet for represent this concept. And so uh, for uh, creating end-to-end uh, price, uh, stitching of uh, subnets will be uh, required. In addition to uh, stitching uh, subnet, uh, several functionality will be required for uh, creating and uh, provide uh, network slices. For example, uh, slice selection, QS control, encapsulation, decapsulation, etc. And uh, slice gateway provides such a functionality at each boundary of uh, domains. Uh, this slide shows the uh, requirements for Slice Gateway. Uh, slice Gateway uh, will provide uh, uh, mainly two types of role. Uh, first is uh, handling uh, underlying infrastructure to create slices. Uh, second is uh, provide, uh, providing controllability uh, of uh, user traffic to tenant. We are assuming that slices will be uh, provided to third parties or tenant, and they uh, use network slices as uh, part of their own service. Uh, 
So uh, some uh, tenant may need to uh, control uh, their user traffic on Slice. So Slice Gateway provides such uh, functionalities. So uh, this matrix uh, uh, lists uh, the requirements for Slice Gateway. So, and uh, this figure shows the uh, uh, overview of Slice Gateway structure. A uh, Slice Gateway is composed of a uh, Slice Gateway function, a uh, Slice Gateway, Gateway controller, and uh, several uh, data plane entity, uh, data plane entities. And uh, Slice Gateway controller has uh, two types of APIs. First is uh, for managing slices, and it's connected to the higher operation system higher level operation systems such as orchestrator. And second is uh, for uh, controlling user traffic on slices. And it's uh, open to the tenant. And tenant uh, uh, can uh, control their customer traffic uh, on slices. And in the following few slides, uh, I will introduce uh, related work on our related work on slice gateway. Uh, so uh, in the, in MEF, uh, we proceed. We are proceeding the evaluation uh, evaluation test uh, feasibility test of uh, creation of end-to-end slice across uh, multiple administrative domains. It, uh, this figure shows the scenario of POC in MEF, and uh, or several orchestrators uh, cooperate each other and uh, create a Slice subnet in each domain. And Slice Gateway uh, connects uh, the uh, subnets and uh, create uh, end-to-end Slice. Uh, this is uh, exhibited in the MEF uh, 2019, and uh, it won award uh, this year, uh, uh, MEF award in this year. Uh, second is a uh, uh, feasibility test of uh, VR ping pong application as future application. So uh, NTT and Jiku Technologies uh, uh, developed uh, VR ping pong as a, and, and uh, clarifying the, uh, what requirement uh, such application have and how to uh, collaborate uh, application and uh, network. So uh, VR Pingpong uh, is composed of several types of applic applications. So players, audience, and viewers. Uh, players play uh, Pingpong in the VR space, and uh, you can enter the same VR space as audience and uh, can watch a uh, Pingpong game nearby player. And this content also provides a uh, video streaming, and you can uh, watch uh, uh, the ping pong game uh, with a tablet or a PC. And these applications have different uh, requirements on communication. So, for example, player plays ping pong, and the ping pong uh, causes uh, high speed rally. So, low latency communication is very important. And ping pong game is uh, most important factor in this content, and so the traffic must be protected. On the other hand, uh, video streaming uh, doesn't require uh, real-time communication. It requires just broadband. So uh, we uh, prepare the several types of slices and game application select uh, appropriate slices. So for example, uh, players start uh, the ping pong, uh, the game, and game server uh, recognize the device has uh, player's load. So request, uh, a central request to allocate the uh, traffic to the player's slice. And uh, this content can work, even if uh, traffic congestion uh, happens, uh, will occur. So uh, this uh, is uh, just an example of API. So a game application uh, sends uh, request, uh, including a flow identifier and a trans, uh, Slice ID. And Slice, uh, Slice Gateway Controller translates the API to the uh, concrete network configuration and enforce it uh, to the data plane entity. 
So uh, game application uh, don't require to understand uh, concrete uh, network topology or configuration in this model. So uh, finally, uh, I will talk about uh, next step of this document. So we're uh, planning to uh, breaking down the uh, northbound interface with referring uh, definition and specification of uh, NSDT in at this working group. Also, uh, we provide uh, use cases where uh, SLZ or subnet concept uh, will be beneficial. Uh, anyway, uh, so we have very few feedback, and so uh, pr uh, please read this draft and send your feedback. Thank you very much. Any questions? Speaking as uh, the design team member, not as working group chair, I'm very happy with your next steps. The step number one, we are aligning terminology. So for example, it would be highly unsuitable to say it's a subnet. We know that subnet is not what they meant, right? So I would really expect you to use terminology and vocabulary that we have established in uh, design team in your document and uh, find the right place in hierarchy of controllers, if you wish, where it really belongs with regards to northbound communication to really going down to particular technology. Yeah, so uh, this document is published in ITF, so uh, the terminologies should be uh, ITF friendly. So I will uh, change, uh, modify the definition to, to the regime. Yeah, Dave Allen Erickson. Um, just a quick question for clarification. I'm trying to understand the relationship between the slicing gateway and the UPF and the 5G architecture and how that relates to the various interfaces. Uh, yeah, so uh, Slice Gateway uh, is not a uh, device, so it's just definition. So I uh, provide a mapping uh, this functionality to uh, 5G systems. Okay, yeah. that's in the draft? Okay, thank you. Chizun from Huawei. Yeah, actually I think uh, it is very useful to uh, specify the use cases uh, uh, which you have already think about our very mat in which can be used for the uh, network slicing and can document it here. This will be very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Evangelos Halapidis. Thanks. Sorry. Hello, my name is Evangelos Halepridis. And I'm closer? closer? Yes. This is better? Yeah. Yeah, great. So, my name is Evangelos Halepridis, and on behalf of my colleagues, I'd like to um, present you our take of uh, forces based uh, BNG. By the way, my activities are carried with funding provided by the Stand ISD initiative from um, the EU with. Uh, uh, 780439 program, a grand agreement under the Horizon 2020 program. So I don't know uh, how many of you saw the mail yesterday that the ITF is not going to continue activity on the BNG. Uh, our uh, take is that uh, uh, the ITF has already existing solutions that, can, that can address this and can um, provide uh, solutions for um, separating control in a foreign plane. Right. Well, so, I mean, since you, you brought the, the topic up, um, there was a liaison yesterday from the uh, IESG to Broadband Forum that basically said, you know, uh, work on disaggregated BNG had been suspended in the IETF in March, and that suspension will continue until, uh, you know, a decision, a change in decision is made by request from BBF or something. So, um, like, moving forward, um, I, I, I guess you're saying, like, forces is a top technology that could be reused, right, for, exactly. for BNG, yes, which exactly. is good, but um, based on, 
you know, the IESG's feedback in the future, um, like we, we probably won't be allocating time to discussion of this, but you know, um, right. sure. so if, if like BBF wanted to look at forces and say, oh, that's really good and then request, oh, hey, forces is great, right. that's fine. But um, we're not gonna be allocating time until there's right. any change in that. Agreed, no problem. Okay. So what we're going to show is, you know, going to, to showcase that um, this is an ITF solution already that can actually support these kind of scenarios. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Well, so yeah, I guess <laughs> it would be useful, I guess, since, since you brought the topic up, um, since you, you know, it would be okay. good to just have a moment of discussion about the liaison statement and, uh, and so on. I, I think that's, that's what uh, Dave Senecorpe has stood up for. Right, yeah. So yeah. Dave Senecorpe um, speaking is the IETF liaison manager to BBF. So yes, that liaison went out from the ISG to BBF yesterday. And um, it did, you, that was a great summary, Chris, thank you. It basically said, we're gonna suspend all work on the disaggregated BNG here. Forces, um, I can tell you, was a topic for discussion within the broadband forum. Mm -hmm. And um, while there has been a protocol selection done for the control plane to user plane protocol, um, which is PFCP, there's been two liaisons from BBF mm -hmm. to IETF say, stating such. Uh, you know, topics like this are always welcome in that venue. Thanks, thanks. We, we want to showcase the um, the use the the importance of having a data model actually to support the, the, the protocol. That's one. I'm sorry, that. I can't hear you. There's a full blown discussion sure. in back so, of me. Uh, <laughs> the, I think the importance of this talk is that to showcase that uh, having a data model alongside the protocol is pretty useful and it can support more than simply the separation, but can add more functionality and and there is and work. Research. There's also work there going on uh, regarding the data model and the management plane as oh, well. So I'd like to see yeah, some kind. I of can talk to you offline okay. about some of the detail. Thank Thanks. You. So Dan Bogdanovic, uh, I would be interested to see more on a distributed architecture for a BNG, but okay. that would be a for start implementation independent, unless you really have an implementation that you can present the results of that. Okay, thanks for your comment. Sure. <clears throat> Uh, Diego Lopez Telefonica, I'm not in the front page, but I, am, I, be, I feel myself one of the um, um, accomplices of Evangelos for, for preparing this. And uh, our original intent when, when we started talking about this was precisely, it's not only about VNGs, and this is why I believe that this current title, current focus is somehow connected to this uh, statement for, for the ASG. But our intention was precisely to explore the idea of a, of a unified mechanisms for access. Yes. Call it BNGs, call it whatever the 3GPP call it on the, uh, in, uh, in 5G, call it what you use for cable uh, connections. Is is in general for the access side of the, of the internet. At least for us is extremely important. Yes, so, so it's it's the BNG is usually it's um, most of as a use case uh, that we can showcase the the use of forces as well, right? Yeah, uh, Greg Mirsky ZT uh, pretty much concur uh, with the previous statement that um, there are a lot of things that can benefit with, from their uh, controlled user plane separation. So um, I think that the right way uh, thing would be is just to look at them, uh, whether it's access network uh, specifically, and then uh, get the requirements, agree on the requirements, and see what the uh, generality we can produce. Again, without any specifics of say, talking about uh, distributed BNG. Yeah. I was going to concur with the rest, but I'm not going to repeat that. I have a question for you. So how does the decision, I saw the report in regards to forces and the BBF, uh, and uh, it didn't seem talk, to be. Talking to the microphone. The, the, the and, analysis, uh, the analysis of why day. forces was considered. I think there was something published. How does the decision get made? Uh, do you, does the BBF contact somebody through you, and then you go and find the forces people and have that discussion? Because we, I was never informed that the BBF was looking at it. And I've, okay. I've been very so, so the uh, the liaison statements uh, are public documents. They get sent. No, no. I'm, get looking, posted. I'm talking about the process. 
what is the process that the BBF uh, is right. probably so, looking So the process for? involves these public liaison statements. And then I don't within... I'm, make, I'm not, uh, you're not... You're not understanding my question. What is the process for the BBF to request the oh. ITF that they were evaluating forces? So I, I suggest we take that offline okay. because that's BBF process business that we really don't know about. And you can discuss it offline with someone, but it's not really our business. Okay, thank you. So I have one less comment to make. Okay. Um, uh, I will say, uh, as a quite kind of a public service announcement, which I didn't cover in the last time I was at this mic, um, the broadband forum has actually changed their operating, um, I would say operating procedures, but it's not really procedures. They've changed their bylaws such that uh, now anyone, anyone, can approach the broadband forum, pay a subscription fee or an access fee and get access to all of their work in progress. They are now nearly as open as the IETF for a small fee. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks for that update. So um, since we've had, what, what, okay, we'll have one more comment related to the, um, and, a, and a possible follow-up from Dave, should it be required, um, on uh, the liaison statement and, and that that aspect of this, and then we'll let you get on with your actual presentation. So we came from China Mobile. You know that uh, there are about 10,000 beings in our network. Uh, the protocol between control plan and user plan is very important for us. Uh, uh, when I'm happy the, the, to see that uh, there are another solution for uh, this, uh, these things. Maybe I think it's a, it's a good uh, direction. Uh, as I know that uh, the, the solution, uh, the solution from the PBS, but they could, they could uh, contain there are all the requirements of uh, China Mobile. For example, the CDN is not uh, the scope of PBS solution. But the uh, CDN is uh, very important for us because they are little, uh, they are lack of private IPv4. So uh, I think this solution is very good. And then maybe I will talk about the details of the, uh, of the meeting. Okay, so okay, thank I, you. I had a hard time little understanding you. Uh, I couldn't hear very well. So I think the last statement was she'll talk to you after this meeting directly. So yeah. that yeah, that would be the, good to to follow up on, I think she likes the idea and would, so let's, let's cut this off here and you two talk after the meeting. Uh, yeah, so that yeah, the requirement of the DBD is very clear for us. Okay. Yeah, are we okay with you, the use case? Let's talk after the meeting. Yeah, sir. Okay, thanks, I, had, I have a hard time uh, understanding you, sorry. Hi. Um, so Dave Senko again, liaison manager of the BBF. Uh, if, if there are requirements, I mean, the document was sent over in, I think, one of the liaisons, the latest relays on, I would encourage people to take a look at it, review it. If there are requirements that need to be covered or should people feel are missing, um, that process is still open in the BBF. Uh, so feel free to approach them. Thank you. For a reasonable fee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I missed that. No, nothing, nothing. <laughs> uh, so I should, I should ignore him as usual? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay. Okay. okay, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, thanks, Diego, for bringing that up. So the, the BNG is actually a use case that we want to to showcase that we can support multiple, multiple access types and multiple scenarios. Uh, so um, how many of you know forces? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. Okay. So uh, I'll just do a very brief intro. So forces is an ITF solution for some time ago. Uh, there are a couple of RFCs already published. Uh, we had two successful um, interoperability tests. And Forces uh, has a number of, uh, uh, of features like availability, publish subscribes, and uh, request response. Uh, I think the, the most, import, Im most important is that the, the, the protocol is uh, independent of the model. Um, 
So uh, forces models the uh, the functions of the data plane using what we what we call the logical functional block. So it's an abstraction of the functions of the data plane. Um, the forces model is object oriented and has the um, has several advantages of this. Like we have um, inheritance, we have augmentations. Um, so a developer can define the components, uh, capabilities, and events of um, uh, of a data plane function, and he can manipulate that and uh, which the, the components and which actually change the behavior of the can change the behavior of, of the data path program. Uh, so packets come in on optional metadata and they are being altered by the data path program possibly and uh, exit as um, uh, additional metadata or changed and. Uh, proceed to the next uh, LFB class. So we have LFB classes that are instantiated and connected into a graph, uh, which uh, actually creates creates a service. So why force? Uh, it's an existing ITF solution. It has been proven, it has been used. Um, it provides a, a data model that can uh, support, uh, it, it is extensible, um, it allows you to define, among other things, capabilities and events. Um, LFB graphs can be dynamic. So a control plane uh, application can actually change the behavior or, and change the, the services that exist in the, in the foreign plane. Uh, it can natively support any type of access, as we said before, and we'll, show, and, uh, we'll showcase how. And as I said before, any new LFB included into the uh, into the foreign plane does not have any impact on the protocol. Right? So we can add as many new existing or new LFBs, and the, the protocol is going to to stay the same. Uh, so as we said before, the, the, we use the BNG as a, as a use case, and we took a look at the, the PPOE um, as an example. Um, so, for example, the, the, we have a, a port LFBs that in, uh, have, you know, incoming uh, traffic and based on specific values of ether type uh, and the PPP control um, uh, control field, uh, this may be need to be sent to this will be needed to be sent to the control plane to be handled uh, by some kind of tunneling infrastructures, which could be VXLAN, GRE, or even uh, forces supports. A way to to transport to the to the control plane, which will then be sent back into the data plane to be sent to 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 the subscriber, to the subscriber side. Right. Uh, so uh, when uh, the user has been authenticated and authorized to use the uh, to, to to proceed to to the network, uh, then the, the control plane is going to. Uh, program the classifier in order to allow this the, the subscriber traffic to pass through. It goes through the classifier, through the PPO LFB in order to encapsulate to decapsulate the PPP and PPPO headers, IP routing to discover the next uh, the next hop and then goes out into the network. Uh, on the way back, of course we have a similar kind of graph of LFBs. So it goes through a, an instance of a LFB class, goes through the a classifier LFB uh, back to it discovers that um, this is for a specific user has been, has been subscribed based on the, on the destination IP address. Goes to the IPv routing LFB. Goes to the PPVOE LFB to be encapsulated in PPVOE um, packets out of the port LFB towards the, sub the subscriber side. Right. So uh, once traffic goes through the VBNG, we need to be able to, to monitor the traffic in order to, to find, uh, you know, get statistics and um, possibly um, usage, uh, usage measurements in order to do uh, accounting. Uh, there are a number of ways to, this can be done via forces. You could actually, the control plane could poll the phone plane and specific for example, the PPPO LFB could uh, hold uh, stats, or the control plane could um, the control plane could subscribe to events uh, for statistics, so it can get uh, notifications uh, for for statistics. Or even better, if, even uh, another solution would be to to create a specific LFB for that uh, for, for monitoring. 
right? As we said before, um, we can sub forces supports any kind of uh, access type and can do that by simply creating different uh, LFB classes that will um, be able to handle uh, the different kind of uh, access types, right? Uh, and this, as I said before, has no impact on the protocol. The protocol has specific verbs, set, get, delete, and it, it, is, go, it, is, it manipulates uh, um, components inside the, the LFB class. Uh, whatever, as long as it is modeled using the forces model, the, the forces protocol is able to, to handle that. Right. So now, uh, that was a brief um, view of uh, simply connectivity service. So what happens if we want to, to have new, new service in, uh, into the BNG? So we, we can simply add new LFBs into the graph. Right. For example, for a bandwidth, bandwidth management service, we can add a policer LFB, or we can have a quota enforcement service. Uh, and again, this has no impact at all for the protocol. So, um, and this is an example for, um, so we can simply add uh, an LFB into, the, into an existing graph, uh, and we can sim so that we can have a bandwidth management service. And uh, similarly for the, for, for the down, downstream um, uh, traffic. Like, uh, and we can even go one step further and have uh, specific services for specific users. Right? We can classify a user based on some characteristic like the uh, service type or um, whatever, you know, based on uh, IP address or MAC address. Uh, and this one, the, the classifier will select uh, the next uh, LFB that's going to be a next graph of LFBs that the, the specific user is going to, to be handled. Uh, so the, we can have um, specific services uh, for, for specific users, right? And for the, for, similarly for the, for the downstream and upstream traffic. Um, right. Uh, so again, having a data model uh, is uh, quite useful in order to be able to support this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, activities so that the protocol is not going to be changed um, it's not going to be changed by any uh, changes of new services or new functions that we want to to add yes thank you yes uh, question Louis Chen from Juniper yes uh, to standardize the protocol in between is a very big challenge the reason why I say that is if you look at so many radius attributes for each vendor, it's over 100 radius attributes. That means different functions due to different hardware implementations. And you want to standardize it. How do you do it? Because radius, already you have a different radius kind of attributes, meaning different uh, implementations in different vendors. Only a very small set of standard attributes today in ITF for the radius sections. All the rest is AVP or Special, uh, special attributes, vendor specific attributes, VSA. Okay. So how you standardize this? Right. The second so, question actually is, you want to standardize something which is also difficult to see is like a line cut reboot. A line cut crash, instead of, I mean, dropping thousands of user, you still send a message, one message to the control plane. How you digest those messages, standardize that one is another problem for me. I mean, for me to see actually this system. Okay, so for the, fir for the first question, if I understand correctly, you say, how do you standardize the connection to the radius server? No, 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 sorry, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. What I'm saying actually, because today, radius is the major one using, right? Yes. And already, different vendor has a very big dictionary, VSA, which okay. is very vendor specific kind of things. Only a very small portion is standardized. Right now, you're going to standardize all these things using one protocol. That means every vendor needs to use the same dictionary, which is difficult. So, I yeah, okay. so uh, you're talking about, I think he's talking about the control path. Yes, I, you, right? you think Where about using radius. That doesn't change. Yeah, Nothing changes there. Understand, but then the protocol, That's either talk to the mic or take it the out. The protocol is an ITF standard already. Yeah, it's already you, standardized. Yeah, I need to force the information, translate the radius. Sorry, Sorry, microphone. You need to translate all these kind of radius from a control plane to into the forwarding plane. And that may have well, vendor specific okay. things, right? Oh, yeah. Hold on, hold on. So, so there, is no uh, there is no data path to control path for using radius. Radius is a subscriber management. Uh, right. But you still need to enforce. So you still need to enforce, in event, uh, uh, enforce it in some way, right? 
you know, program the kind of things into the forwarding plane. And that one actually you have to mean, you know, that it's not so simple. So, so let's um, take it out of, let's take yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, well, yeah, we'll, we'll let that pass. Okay. Uh, Dan Bogdanovich. So on the, um, no, not this, okay. First of all, one of the thing which, um, my brain is now completely fried down. Uh, having a fixed set of basic primitives and then adding vendor extensions on top of it makes, in general, the community um, life easier because they're saying we have a certain semantics and syntax that we can all use and then we can do vendor extensions on top of that. On that part, I, you know, uh, I agree. And uh, Luis said that, you know, this thing with the radius is a good example because there are a few common ones and then many vendor specific ones. That's a pretty good approach. And I personally like uh, that approach to be uh, move forward. There are two things what I have with the, you know, with the forces. I like the idea. Their question is, is there a, a implementation? Because there are other frameworks like that where you can model the data plane and put it into that are much more used. And if you could explain why forces is better than the other existing frameworks that are getting a lot of traction within the industry, then we can evaluate, then we can evaluate that. So I can, you know, I can mod, I can use Cap and Proto to model the data plane and, exp and, and expose it up North Stream. So why should I can, there are plenty of other ones and I can say, I can, let me finish now, and then he, I'm, I'm asking him, I'm not asking you, yep. as far, I'm go asking ahead. him. Yeah, go ahead. So if you can say the combination, I mean, sorry, if you can do the comparison, why this versus the other, what are the benefits of using this versus the others, I'm happy with that, to consider it. Okay. So, so maybe there's a slide on that, right? As why you want to use forces. Right, so, so yeah. forces actually is... So, is so I think we're gonna, we're so gonna let them respond, and, and then, and then so respond the to the mic, and then we're gonna shut down the discussion. Uh, okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. So, uh, forces is not only, you know, um, a way to um, um, package things together and send it to the other side, right? So it's not only about uh, doing um, serialization and deserialization. It has, uh, it, it's an architecture, right? It has the model, it has uh, the protocol. The protocol has already specific capabilities like, uh, as we said, um, high availability, uh, event subscriptions, um, uh, it is transport layer agnostive. Um, you can have augmentations of models, you can do all these kind of things. So it's not about serialization and serialization. Right? So uh, from what I understand from Cap and Proto or any other serialization, deserialization, you have to develop all these kind of features from, uh, you, you have to actually develop this, right? Uh, so forces inherently supports all this. Uh, what we'll, we'll, you, we'll let you do so one, 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 quick, one quick so response, but, one but quick, not like future except, questions. Except being the ITF protocol, the other things that you're putting down here, mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. I, I can use the existing frameworks that are already out there. I just mentioned one. Okay. Okay. A thirty second rebuttal. Okay, just a quick uh, thirty seconds. Okay. So they're not ITF standards. This is an ITF standard. It has been vetted here for many years. Sure, you can go and implement your own thing and you can get a hundred of your friends to work on it. This is a standard, it's been deployed, it's well understood, it's got a lot of scrutiny here at the ITF. Okay, we, we don't, yeah, we don't need to continue the discussion. Th thanks a lot, it was very um, thought-provoking and timely. So, um, so next up, we have uh, Chung Feng Ji presenting. Hey, uh, I would really appreciate if you cut the marketing and keep on 
really describing what's happening, okay? Because slides have marked in some degree. Okay. Uh, you could use this. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Xie Zhongfeng of China Telecom. Uh, it's my pleasure to share some uh, experience about uh, SRV56 deployment uh, of uh, some several operators. Uh, <laughs> this draft is about SRV56 uh, considerations. Actually, it has a uh, uh, relationship with uh, other, uh, one other draft is uh, the SRV56 deployment status. Uh, it introduced progress. This draft introduced progress as a V6 uh, industry, uh, including deployments, implementations, academic contributors, and uh, interoperability tests. And as, as you maybe you maybe you know that there are sev seven deployments uh, worldwide: uh, SoftBank, China Telecom, China Unicom, and uh, Sunnet, etc. And then in, in this, in this, uh, in our draft, uh, we mainly introduce uh, deployment uh, suggestions, to provide some uh, suggest to uh, some uh, suggest about network transition and uh, um, uh, solutions to in some uh, specific scenarios. Uh, we also introduce uh, uh, detailed about the experience of SRVC deployment, uh, where where the the, the earlier draft uh, gives some uh, deployment status uh, and the features, of, uh, at least the features of the SRV deployments. And we all know that uh, uh, as, uh, IPv6 uh, developed quickly during the past several years, uh, including China and uh, major operator has deployed IPv6 nationwide. So which gave a strong uh, foundations for SRV deployment uh, we all know that uh, SRV6 has a following advantage is that uh, uh, first is that uh, IPv6 road uh, aggregation. Uh, this is compared with uh, uh, MPS, uh, SR MPS, because uh, in SR MPS, it will adopt uh, 32 bits um, <coughs> segment, which will be advertised across all the domain network. But uh, in, in SRV6, because it uh, uh, it, in, in, it uses the uh, native IPv6 feature so the route can be aggregated to re reduce the issue of the, uh, of the routing issues, scalability issues. So we also can see that SRV6 provides end-to-end auto, uh, uh, end -to -end service uh, auto start, which means service agility uh, because uh, because for SR, SR MPS, it need to upgrade all the nodes to support, uh, uh, support the capability. But uh, in SRV6, we only need to uh, can be deployed based on actual requirements uh, of the uh, based on the operators. <coughs> then uh, we all know that SRV6 can be on-demand on upgrade, which reduces the service provision time. And uh, so we can set SR has several advantages. Uh, this draft also gives some uh, deployment guidance, guidance for SRV deployment. We all know that there's two uh, options for this network transition. The first one is from IP MPS to IPv6, then uh, SRV6. And the second one is from IP MPS to uh, SMPS and to SRV6. So <clears throat> from our experience, we think that the first one may be more natural and uh, straightforward. So we recommend. So right now we recommend the option, the option one. Uh, <clears throat> it is a, it is very simple that we should uh, make all the network to be IPv6 capable, uh, as what we have done in right now. So then secondly, we need to upgrade the some edge routers, uh, some edge device to be as service capable based on the actual demand of the service. Then next, we uh, upgrade uh, the network to uh, in the immediate nodes, in some of the immediate nodes to support uh, 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 to support IPv6, to support SRV6 to meet to enable traffic uh, engineering, uh, traffic engineer and uh, SFC, etc. Then next, we, we, we will we will 
uh, plan to upgrade all the network to B and uh, to end SRV6. So <clears throat> SRV6, uh, which uh, this case has been mentioned uh, several times, uh, just SRV6 in China, uh, field trail in China Telecom, actually is in Sichuan province. This Sichuan is a very big province. Uh, it's similar to the uh, to size of uh, Germany. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, this case uh, we depend on the architecture of the whole network. In China Telecom, we have two backbones, IP backbones. One is 163, which is a native uh, IP network. Of course, it is IPv4 and IPv6 dual stack, which provide uh, many uh, internet access service and uh, IDC service, and also uh, and, and also some uh, mobile internet services, etc. And uh, another, the other backbone is seen to which provide, uh, which pro which is MPR space. It mainly provides some kind of service to enterprise users. So, in <clears throat> traditional approach, maybe uh, in the, uh, this. This you know, traditional approach, the enterprise service carries into, but uh, uh, differently in, in this case, the video traffic for for the interconnection, video uh, tra the video platform interconnection uh, is carried in 163 because 163 provide abundant bandwidth, but which can meet the requirements of the video uh, video service. So in order to uh, deploy service quickly. We we implement uh, PE routers to be IPv uh, to be SRV6 keeper, so we can provide service quickly in short time, which improves the service uh, service uh, provisioning uh, provides uh, improve the speed of the service provisioning. The second uh, deployment case is China Unicom. Uh, the backbone of China Unicom is. 169, it's one called 169, actually it's a number. Uh, in this case, it many years, uh, SRV6 has been adopted for the collection of uh, cloud data centers. The cloud data center actually is similar to uh, to China Telecom to some extent. So in this case, uh, because China uh, the, the backbone network has been IPv6 rider, all over the country, including the metro network. So uh, we, has, uh, we have some end-to-end uh, -end IPv6 uh, foundation network for SRV6 deployment. So in this case, we uh, deploy PE equipment to make it enable SRV6 for the uh, SF deployment. And any question? Yeah, real quick question. This is Dino. Um, can you put values to smoothly and quick? Sorry. You said it smoothly migrates. Can you put some data behind it so we can judge what's smooth and what's not smooth and how quick you switched over? You mean the uh, switch over? Uh, migration? Yeah. When the one in the last slide, when the 163 went down, mm -hmm. how, how long did it take you to get to the other one? You mean the, uh, the speed, right? Service yeah, speed. in time. In time. Uh, uh, milliseconds, seconds, hundreds of milliseconds. It's not a second. Actually, because uh, this is, is a service for uh, enterprise users, uh, traditionally we maybe take uh, more than one month because we need to uh, undergo some kind of procedure. It's a long time. But now maybe several days, this service can be uh, prevented to customer. If this is not for ordinary users. Okay. Did you do any measurements on the switch over time? Uh, not yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, Tony Lee. Uh, it seems like most of what you're doing here is all just VPN stuff. Is there yeah, any, VPN. Okay. any actual TE going on here? It has not been, uh, TE maybe is on the agenda, has not been done yet. Okay, so you could be doing this with something much simpler than SRV6, yes? Yes, um, maybe in the future. <laughs> okay, so then how much bandwidth did you waste to get this VPN? Uh, yeah. How much bandwidth, right? In China Telecom, the, the service, the bandwidth service range from uh, gigabits, 
uh, GPS uh, to 10 gig, uh, to 10 gig. So it's a, a large range for the bandwidth. You, you seems like you could have been doing this with a much simpler, lower bandwidth VPN solution. Did you compute how much extra bandwidth this is taking? Uh, this is Robin, uh, Tony, I, I understand. So I think the benefit I think is plain here is across mass, multiple domain. Yeah, because yeah. you know here, this you mentioned that the backbone is the IP, the pure IP. So that's the difficult to deploy VPN. Uh, you can run GRE it can over may take a long IP time before to cross domains just fine today. Okay, uh, Tony, so we offline. So, so in China Unicom, uh, so, uh, it set up the uh, P equipment to be as service capable, so, uh, so the VPN traffic can be transversed from one autonomous system to another, which means from, for example, from Beijing to Guangdong province. And also, we all know that uh, um, uh, Guangdong province has also implemented SRV6 based uh, VPN service uh, in uh, in Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and uh, well, Dongguan cities. So based on, on our experience, SRV6 has shown, shown its advantage in, in terms of service agility and uh, uh, incremental uh, migration. Uh, so we think that uh, SRV6 is very attractive and very valuable for the future network deployment. Of course, it needs more, uh, more deployment cases uh, for, for, the, uh, for the evaluation and uh, maybe we need to, for the maturity of the network in the future. Uh, it can also be used for 5G uh, transport and the data centers, uh, et cetera. So we hope that uh, um, based on more experience, more input will be provided for uh, such as uh, IPv6 address uh, SRV locator and uh, SRV SID design policy, et cetera. So, uh, we welcome any more feedbacks and uh, cooperations uh, in the future. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, that's all. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick question. Um, how many SRV6 hops do you anticipate you would deploy? You mean this S uh, SRV6? Yes. Or SRV6? Uh, okay, uh, how many SIDs would be in the SRH header? Uh, SRE? Sorry. How many hops in the source route do you anticipate with a network deployment? Uh, Dino, uh, answer this question. So, and uh, in fact, uh, now that's uh, only the edge node. There's no SRH now. Yeah, because the VPN. For the VPN, there's no SRH. Yeah, no SRH. Yeah, but uh, then we will think about that's uh, the loose uh, hop, can, loose okay. key. Can you maybe... answer the question just in general? Yeah, yeah, yeah. General, deploy, I think. Uh, what do you, yeah. what, how many hops do you think would be? Yeah, yeah, I think that was the backbone we think about that is uh, the five to six, and the maximum maybe ten. Thirty. Ten. Did you say three zero? Sorry. 10. Thirty hops in the SRH times sixteen bytes. Are you going to give your user any data? Uh, one hundred and six bytes. Huh? One hundred and six bytes. Hundred and six. Ten bytes? segment. Ten segment. David Dai from CICT. Can you scroll back to the slide with the incremental deployment? Yeah, this, this one. And as a step one is from your side, the upgrade to IPv6. And to my, stand, to my understanding, the update from IPv4 to IPv6, maybe from the core network is first. And mm -hmm. your step two is upgrade to the age device first. <laughs> So um, my question is, if we just uh, update the IPv4 um, f from the core network and um, the, with the edge network key staying in the IPv4, before, then um, what's your consideration for this application scenarios? Uh, my understanding is that, uh, uh, is that in, uh, in, our, in our case, uh, because IPv6 has been uh, realized everywhere, IPv6 has uh, been capable, has been ready every part of the network. So we think that uh, maybe this transition from uh, IP, IPv6 uh, and IP, SRV6 will be a, 
uh, will be a better choice than uh, as our MPS. But maybe for other, uh, uh, maybe for other operators, we they will have a, we have specific, uh, specific requirements for network requirements. Maybe uh, as as uh, SRM MPS will be a better choice. That's my understanding. Thank you. My question is maybe in some application scenarios, we updated the edge device first. And, on, and, and, uh, and to the other application scenarios, maybe we update the core devices first. Then yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. So it depends on the actual scenario, okay. Uh, with Hendrix, Nokia. Can you go back to the slide where you do the comparison on the, yeah. I think here you are, I, you're comparing native MPLS, but there is also uh, implementations where you do segment routing MPLS over, over IP. Mm -hmm. And if you would take this comparison into account, all your uh, things are, are actually not true what is here. So you're, you're comparing just uh, one thing from the other, but there is other ways to achieve that, in which case this, uh, this analysis is not 100% uh, uh, up to date with all the capabilities which we have available in the ITF. Okay, uh, actually this, this is not actually for an absolute uh, comparison of two technology. <laughs> I think maybe uh, in some cases, uh, SMPS will have its advantage over SRV6. So this depends, as I has mentioned, this depends on the, depend on the actual uh, uh, use case. Well, I just want to point out that I, you're confusing people uh, who are reading this. Yes, it's, maybe. It's not, uh, it's, I, I think if you want to document how you are migrating to SRV6, mm -hmm. I think it's, that's, that's okay to, to do, but I think, just make sure that you do, that you compare the full spectrum if you do a comparison. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. We we made, we made some adjustment, necessary adjustment. Satoru from SoftBank. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, your experience at deployment uh, in detail. I just I'll make some coin comment. Um, I'm really happy to see your yeah, uh, deployment uh, not on the green field. So many people claim that hey, SRV could require uh, fully greenfield uh, deployment case, but so you show <clears throat> a good example that that SRV6 doesn't require a greenfield to be deployed. And also, if you have some uh, <clears throat> chance to in introduce TE future, uh, mm -hmm. I saw this, some discussion here. But um, if you consider that some control plane technique like uh, uh, Flex Argo or something uh, to abstract this intent topology or path. Uh, so it would be a good idea to reduce it, the size of the seed and size uh, the number of the seed in the pocket. I think you can still keep the uh, one seed in just IPv6 destination address in the IPv6 header. That would be fine to, to do the uh, traffic engineering future, even for the uh, uh, inter-domain case, if the uh, inter-domain flex algo is possible. Thanks. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. So this, yes, this depends on the progress of the uh, compressed, uh, uh, compressed uh, SRV6 standard. Okay, so uh, compressed, uh, a little bit um, scare me that the, when we mentioned that the compressed header discussion, you know, so the, the, not to reduce the header itself, but uh, put the uh, multiple semantics in just one one hundred twenty-eight bit field. That would be my my point. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. So thanks, and uh, all deployment cases are very useful. Please keep them bringing. And uh, personally, I would be really interested to see migration from T based network storage, CPT, where, for example, reservation is done in band versus moving to computation is done off, and how people solve problems with regards to bandwidth resource reservation. Kind of would be really interesting use cases to discuss here. Uh, yeah, so uh, next up is Waimo Chen. Hello everyone, I'm Huan Mo Chen from Xiuqiwei. Today I'm going to talk about the SRT pass midpoint fast protection. 
So first, let's uh, give an overview. So we have existing uh, fast FR for midpoint. However, when a midpoint of SR pass fails, the traffic will, will lost for some time, even though the existing FR for midpoint is used. So our solution is provide a protection for that period of time. That means that with our solution, the failure of middle point of SR pass will be fully protected. So here, uh, in this uh, figure, we give an example. For example, we have a SR pass from node B to node C. So we go through node N and the node C. So when node N fails, so node P will, pro will provide faster protections. However, when IGP converges, the traffic will get lost because after IGP converges, node B will not have routes to node N. So for the traffic go through node N to node C, those traffic were, 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 were dropped. Only after another new pass, new end to, to end pass from B to C is installed on the B and then traffic is recovered. So we can see that the traffic get lost from the point at which the IGP confer converges until the new end to end pass is installed. So for that, for those period of time, which marked by the red, red line, that during that period of time, the traffic gets lost. So our solution is provide fast protections against the midpoint failures for that period of time. So with our protection, the failure of a midpoint is fully protected. So basically, we uh, we, we have a revision of uh, several versions. So updates to the previous version is that. Uh, we changed the title as suggested. So originally we use a, a segment uh, routing proxy forwarding. So right now we use a SRT pass midpoint protection. So this is more uh, is better than the previous one. In addition to that, so originally we use a, a router capability TLV to distribute the capabilities for uh, proxy forwarding. Uh, so we change that one to router functional capability TLVs. So this one, I think this one is, is much better than the previous one. So in addition to that, we add uh, sections, security considerations and uh, IANA considerations, and then some editorial changes. So any comments and suggestions? Uh, Louis Chen from uh, Juniper. I do foresee that actually it's a good thing to have a PRL for this kind of operations, but there's an issue actually, I'm not sure because the diagram is a, a, it's a very simple one. Is it possible that's because IGP, the synchronization kind of timing sequence, it was possible there's some kind of a, a drops actually during the switching. So even your PRL, you still have trouble of that one. It's like a micro loop problem. Micro looping avoidance problem actually is similar there. Later on, I can tell you actually offline, but this is possible. Uh, looks like uh, the the issue you mentioned that is uh, is invisible because this one is uh, we can see. Just look at this example. So when node N fails, then node P will provide fast protections, and then uh, IGP convergence. Whatever, whatever convergence, so we, we can uh, focus on the the node B. Correct. I'm so, saying actually, when the IGB progress, there were different update of the state and due to synchronization of the control plane, um, synchronization of the, of the forwarding plane and control plane, there will be a little bit issues there. I will show you later on actually. Yeah, yeah I think that one is a is minimum, uh, is, is a minimum, I see. So this one, uh, <laughs> maybe you have some very tiny sorry, sorry. Uh, in, in, in synchronized. What I'm yeah. saying actually, there will be possible packet loss during that time. Yeah, no, no, okay, I don't, you I don't have PLR, yeah, yeah. But yeah. still you have a possible packet loss doing something like a Lumbeck loop avoidance problem. Actually. Yeah, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a, the IGP in sync for some period of time. 
But those one here is our focus is this big big period of time. So that a uh, minor, minor, minor microbe may, may be there because that's a IGP in sync for a short period of time. I, I got that. Mm -hmm. Martin Hornefer, Deutsche Telekom. Have you considered that in many cases just using any cast groups for the midpoints might solve the problem as well, maybe even faster? Yeah, for any cast, I think that there are some issues. I think we consider that those are any cast uh, uh, solutions. What what are the um, big issues with any cast? Yeah, I can, I, offline I, I can give more details. Uh, yeah, to, to you. Martin. Depending on your network design, you can't always use any cast. How do you place your any cast? It's on some networks. All, yes, it's doable, but not always, I think. Well, I said it uh, may be useful or feasible for many cases. I'm not saying it solves all the cases. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've got to, I think for egress, use any cast is uh, one solution. But for even for egress, there are a couple of issues. And then for midpoint. Uh, Yes, I think maybe use any cast, maybe maybe it's hard. Yeah. Stefan Lukowski, uh, can't you just try to solve it by just delaying the deletion of your ILM? No, this is not uh, by delaying. Uh, yeah, this is uh, in the sense that... If, if P and B are just uh, delaying the deletion of the ILM to N, no, no, this is not delayed. So details, uh, detailed solution like this way. So node P will distribute its capability for proxy for... No, no, no. I, I'm not talking about your solution. I'm talking about something else, which is just P and B are all seeing that N is disappearing from the LSDB. Just keep the ILM program did the forwarding for a couple of seconds. I, I, I don't kind of uh, get your question. Can you say your question in, in more detail? Yeah. What's the issue? Just try to keep your forwarding I, entry I, I, programmed in the hardware. No, no, this is not not, not keep a traditional IP forwarding entry. So, so what, here, the solution is that. Why not? Why not? So there, I think there's a miscommunication here. Um, what Stefan is asking is uh, he understands what the solution you're proposing. Mm -hmm. He's asking. Why not instead use a solution, a different solution that delays the installation of basically of the black hole or of the black hole in the traffic when you have no no entry? Basically, keep keep the old node sit entry. Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, yeah. so. Uh, Stefano's uh, solution or proposal is that. We're just keeping the old uh, IP forwarding, right? Not IP forwarding, MPLS forwarding, not IP. You can delete IP, but you need to keep MPLS yeah, a, because yeah. we solved this kind of issues in LDP convergence with just um, delaying the label withdrawal and, or label drop in the forwarding. Yeah, that's, a, that's a what our solution, that's a what we propose here. So this one basically no no because you are also advertising a lot of stuff but you you can just keep forwarding and just drop control plane. I got to you because uh, the idea is that we want to keep those uh, forwarding for SID, but how we achieve that? So we need to have some ways to let some nodes know or oh, keep this uh, forwarding entry for me for some time. I'm so, not sure that you need to keep a control plane. You can just keep the forwarding without any control. Yeah, yeah. Even though we need a key, we want to keep a forwarding plane, we need a nice let those people know that those nodes know keep a forwarding entry for me for some time, right? Uh, Stuart, so this the, I, this is an incredibly common scenario: egress protection like this is what you're trying to do. Uh, I'm still puzzled as to why there isn't uh, a more elegant solution involving Eddycast. So in that particular scenario, presumably you should use an Eddycast SID for N, in which case uh, ordinary fast reroute would uh, sort the whole problem out. No, ordinary. Uh, so this yes, one, oh, hang on a second. ordinary what, doesn't... Well, 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 let, me this let me explain it then, right? <laughs> so P discovers that it can't get to N anymore. 
all right? So P is going to, does a, a fast reroute to N prime, which is, well, that, that ends any cast address, which should get it to N, N1. Once it's at N1, it will go to C, because that's the next SID. So I would have thought you could have built an Anycast solution uh, for this standard, very common uh, scenario, and it would have just worked. Uh, so I think uh, if you have some solution using Anycast, so Anycast I would six. like to you propose details, and then we can discuss either offline or on the list. Yeah, so I certainly, this is Dino, I certainly support the idea. And there's a lot of reasons why. Because if the SID is an Anycast address, and you have to reroute, the head end doesn't have to change yep. the SRH. This is very useful. And if you're always routing to N, the Anycast address, and you lose the route to the top N, you never have to delete anything from the FIB or any forwarding table, because N will just stay there. It, the next hop just changes. Yeah, I think for Anycast, there's some, a couple of issues. I think uh, one is that Anycast, they have a, a, a routing loops. And also, I think we have we found uh, some issues there. So if I think uh, you, you uh, roughly you can say, oh, we can do, use the Anycast, give detailed solutions, and then we can discuss. So, so the, the other concern I've got, and it's a concern I've always got with these sorts of solutions, is that we reduce it to a sort of trivial cartoon case. When you apply this to a real network with multiple hops um, in there, then it very quickly breaks down. But if you were, if you could any cast to the two exits, then ordinary fast reroute followed by ordinary reconversions would mean that you could deal with any failure in getting from A to the end. Yeah, in theory, in theory, or we have some issues there because we already uh, have pictures or figures to show those issues. So if you have time, I can please, show you. Uh, please issues state there. the issues. It would be useful if people could hear what the issues are. Yeah, yeah. Could I, learn for, about. I think for the egress, just be brief. Yeah, yeah. For the egress one, I already sent those uh, issues on the mailing list. So I think you guys propose solutions, give the solutions for no, any cast. No, okay, no, 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 no. So, so have the issues with any cast been stated on the list? Yeah, you, you can uh, uh, see. Uh, have, have they been stated? You gotta, gotta just go and look at the list and I'll find the, the, the argument. So uh, those uh, issues for egress protection use any cast. I send the issues on the list, RTGWG and the Sprint. Well, you said one last night, which basically said there are issues. I don't, I'd, like, I'd like to know what the actual issue is. Yeah, those issues are already, I already sent, I think, uh, last night? Yeah, the one that last night just said there are issues. It didn't say specifically what the failure cases were. Yeah. Uh, actually, I don't mean to defend this, but... Why is it a, a routing loop? But if you the use any cast, the, the, they, they may cause some routing loops. <laughs> the, the reason any cast sit will not solve this Jenks electron from Siena before N1 and... N, you need one any cast to go to C. If you are going to D, you have another N and N2, another any cast for that. Basically, where you go will change the how many any cast you will need, just will not scale. So uh, uh, you see the working group is clearly demanding comparison between any cast which you're proposing. And the best way to address it is addressing the draft, not sending emails to mailing list. Please have comparison section where you compare what working group is proposing versus what you're proposing with benefits of your proposal. Okay, okay. We, can, uh, we, reason, we can discuss right? about the one, uh, any cost, okay, any cost solutions. Yeah. <laughs> Peter? Yeah, I'm still allowed to make a comment. Absolutely. So just for the any cost, maybe I just discuss with uh, Stuart. So the any cost would work if we are doing egress protection, but we are, what Zebu is trying to do is trying to protect the seat in the middle of the uh, that the seed which is in the middle of the SRT stack, right? So it can be like a P node, which is in the stack. Now that fails. It's not the egress node anymore. So that's why you can't have like, what would you do any cast? Every node would have an any cast with some other node. Well, well, with a thousand nodes in the network, yes. But, <laughs> yeah. But then you would have to have thousand any cast addresses as well. Yeah, wow. Well. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is one uh, comment. Sure. If, you want to, if you don't want us to design a good network, we could do it here if you want. You know, but the thing is, is if you're using IPv6 and you have link local, you don't need unique global addresses. So you use link local addresses to realize your IGP, and then all the addresses have unicast at each hierarchy. So I have one comment here. So there is an alternate proposal um, uh, in Spring Working Group for uh, node protection 
for SRT parts that talks about uh, the Anycast solution as well as uh, the keeping the forwarding plane for a longer time. The the uh, proposal that uh, Stephen talked about is explained in the draft. I would request uh, uh, everyone to take a look. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We can uh, look in that look into that those uh, drafts. Yeah, Louis Chen from Juniper. I, I need. I think we need both solutions in any cars and non any cars because reason why if if any cars is no longer T anymore, not T actually no sharp engineering. So uh, observation here. Uh, first, we need to decide with uh, Spring Working Group chairs where we do this work because it's partially belong here because it's faster route, partially in Spring because segment routing, and then potentially we should be able to converge on solutions and decide whether we need both or we agree on something that's addressing everything. And so to your next comment with regards to adoption, we do need to discuss with Spring okay. Working Group what we do and where this will progress. Okay, thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, next up is Bo Wu. Uh, I'm here to give an update of this ITF uh, up young model uh, on behalf of the other authors. Uh, here is uh, this up young model cover because uh, the existing ITF IP, uh, IP model just covers the basic uh, neighbor, uh, like basic static neighbor. Uh, uh, Mac entry, but this app model covers uh, more bits of app implementation, like um, app, app proxy app or gracious app. And we add more like app statistics. And here is the, the current um, app, app tree. And, and here is the changes since uh, like ITF 104, and we just uh, add more editorial improvements to the young modules and security sections. And also based on 104 discussion, we removed up specific discontinuity timestamp added in the deal two version. And so, but we added description to refer to the interface one. And we uh, added proxy up and gracious up example, and we also removed up dynamic learning example because that was a quite obvious one. And so this is all the changes. And and we think that we already re uh, solved all the remaining issues. So we we think that the next step is. That just we solicit more uh, comments on this draft and also waiting for the working group last call. Jeff has, I've read uh, multiple versions of this draft. We are mm -hmm. doing a steady swirl through, you no, know, just simply addressing small issues. I would like to suggest to the chairs that this was ready to go probably three versions ago and that a working group last call would probably push these to completion a lot faster. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Himanshu from Siena, I have a quick clarification question. Mm -hmm. Is static ARP covered in the base IP interface draft or or in this one? It's already covered in IP model. Base. It is covered? Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm I'm happy about the shape model taken and it's definitely almost ready, I would say. Uh, I was promised last update from the co-authors and uh, I'll start initiating young doctor reviews and normal process to uh, further progress draft. And thank you for the good work. Okay, thank you. So 
So thank you everyone for being here. And uh, if someone hasn't signed, please do so. And we'll see you in Vancouver. And safe travel back home. Yeah, the blue sheets are up here at the front, being waved in the air. If you haven't signed, please do. Oh no, I'm going.